Hey, what's up gamers? So, as I mentioned before, I wanted to make an NES game from start to finish. It's not the first time I'm trying to do that, in fact, it's the third. I hope nothing's gonna stop me now and the third time will be the charm and I will finally succeed. But before I start with the development, let's get ourselves familiar with the system first. So what is the NES? In fact, it's just a western localization of Nintendo's one of the most popular video gaming systems, the Family Computer, also known as the Famicom. I guess in the mid-80s people in the west got tired of crappy video games. Probably just like most of us don't really like mobile games now. So Nintendo in their attempt to conquer western markets revamped their Famicom to look like a VCR. It was kinda an odd decision, but it worked. Thus, the NES was born. But in general, it had the same hardware as the Famicom, at least in North America. For that reason, I don't even own an actual NES. In my humble opinion, the best real hardware to experience both NES and Famicom titles is the AV Famicom. So I'm going to use it to test my game. Apart for the AV output and the top loading slot, the best feature of AV Famicom, as all the other versions of Famicom, it doesn't have an anti-piracy protection in it. To be exact, it lacks the lockout chip, which was introduced to the NES. So I can stick in some bootleg cartridges or even my DIY cartridge and it will work just fine. So let's look inside. The heart of the system is the 6502 based CPU 2A03, which runs at 1.79 MHz frequency. By today's standards, this frequency doesn't look that different from the Atari's 2600 1.19 MHz, but it is still a bit faster. If we continue comparing the CPU to the 2600s, we will notice that the NES CPU is not limited to only 4 kilobytes. You can address up to 64 kilobytes now, as you're supposed to with any normal 8-bit CPU. Unfortunately, the NES CPU lacks the BCD mode, so you can't operate decimal numbers. Surprisingly, this mode kind of worked on the Atari 2600, but... I guess instead of that there is a bonus, a 5-channel audio synthesizer, also known as the APU, which coexists in the same microchip as the CPU. This way the NES CPU can output a mono audio signal. The second important part is the PPU, or a picture processing unit. As the name implies, it processes pictures and produces a composite video signal, which is later amplified and outputted to your TV. Contrary to the 2600's TIA chip, which had no video memory, the PPU actually has the access to acquire a large amount of it. For example, the PPU internally has 256 bytes of storage for the character sprites, also known as the object attribute memory. Plus, the PPU can access a whopping 2 kilobytes of video RAM to draw some epic backgrounds in your games. Finally, we have another 2 kilobytes of RAM, also known as the work RAM. Today it doesn't seem like much, but compared to 2600's 128 bytes, this is a lot. We must not forget that by inserting a game cartridge, it becomes a part of the hardware. So let's take a look at the very basic cartridge that was used for the very first games on this console, like the Super Mario Bros or Ice Climber. This very basic cartridge in the emulator world is also known as Enron or Mapper Zero. Compared to the 2600's 
basic 4 kilobyte cartridge which had one ROM chip. This cartridge has two. One of the ROM chips is called PRG and it stores your game's code and the data. The other chip is dedicated to the tile graphics and is called CHR. The CHR ROM can hold up to 8 kilobytes of graphics. Meanwhile, the PRG ROM can store up to 32 kilobytes. So in total, your ROM could not exceed 40 kilobytes. Coming from the Atari 2600, this is humongous. It is 10 times larger than the 2600's basic cartridge. In the later years of the NES, the cartridge capabilities were expanded even more using additional hardware also known as the mappers. But I'm not going to get into them yet. I kinda like that the graphics are in the separate chip. I had some issues with the page alignment on the 2600 when I had everything in one ROM. My code used to push the graphics further in the ROM and caused some glitches. On the NES something like that would never happen. Plus it's kinda cool that you don't need to rewrite the whole ROM if you want to just change few sprites. Similarly to the 2600, the NES is also kinda constrained and doesn't give you full freedom to do whatever you want. At least thanks to the video memory, you don't necessarily need to track every scanline of your TV as on the 2600. But still, you can't draw individual pixels of specified color at XY coordinate. All you can draw is 8x8 pixel tiles from the CHR ROM. The system has two fixed constructs, the character sprites and the background. As I mentioned before, the PPU has 256 bytes dedicated to the character sprites. You can use only half of the CHR tiles for this. The other half is for the background. You can specify up to 64 sprites in total. Since the basic sprite is 8x8 8 8 pixels, similarly to the 2600, you can combine them to form something larger. But you can put more than 8 sprites in one scanline. Otherwise, the PPU will lose track of your sprites and might not draw them. The most popular way to overcome this is to draw some sprites in every other frame. Probably you've already seen that in games that flicker a lot. The one of the bigger things that limits your creative freedom is the lack of colors. The graphic tiles can only have 4 different colors out of 56. Note, one of those colors will be used for the sprite transparency. At least you can swap the colors for your sprites by using different color palettes. The background structure lets you fill a 32 by 30 grid with tiles from the other half of the CHR ROM. Although the first and the last rows of the grid won't be visible on your TV, since the NES NTSC resolution is only 256 on 224. But the worst thing with the background is that you can only change the color palette for 2x2 two two tile blocks. So you have to deal with the fact that 16x16 16 16 pixel blocks of your background will have the same 4 colors. Also, with the default hardware, you can only have 8 palettes per screen. 4 for the character sprites and 4 for the background. Probably that's the reason why the NES games are not that colorful. Also, it's a bit annoying that you can't flip background tiles horizontally like you could do that with character sprite tiles. The bonus feature for the background is that you can actually scroll it. And surprisingly, it could be achieved quite easily. By default, the background screens could be duplicated either vertically or horizontally. So when you scroll, the screen is wrapped around. The most interesting part that this mirroring option is set by soldering a jumper in your cartridge. So say you want to change the way background is mirrored, you need to pull out your soldering iron and resolder the cartridge. Probably I'll try to go in more detail about this in later videos. You can control the NES hardware pretty much the same way as the Atari 2600s. You do a bunch of reads and writes to a specifically mapped addresses that represent a certain hardware. 
Since the NES CPU is pretty much as low as the 2600s, I am going to stick to old good 6502 assembly language. Although there are other ways to make games, like the NES Maker. This time for the development I will go to use the CC65 compiler suit. It has a pretty nice assembler. Now I'm kinda thinking why I haven't used it for my 2600 game, since the 2600 is also supported. Also I'm going to use the make tool to write make files. As usual I will write the code with a text editor of my choosing. It's not that important. You don't have to use anything that's pushed by Microsoft or any such company. It won't make a big difference. For the graphics I'm going to use an application with a funny name, Tile Molester. For sure it might not be the best, but I used it before and it worked for me. Also I'm using the NES screen tool. Not sure if I'm gonna continue using it in the future, but for the very beginning it's very convenient. For the debugging and general testing on my PC, I will be using the FCE UX emulator. So, what the heck I'm gonna make? Since I've mentioned that it's not that difficult to achieve a background scrolling on the NES, I think it would be a sin to make a game without it. The most campy option would be, I think, to make some kind of a space shooter. But I will take a more difficult route. I really like survival games. This is a somewhat new genre, even though there were games like that even back in the day. I personally would love to play some sort of a combination of Don't Starve and a darker and meaner version of Animal Crossing on the Famicom. Of course, my game would be much simpler. For instance, it could have a much smaller Rebuilt map that could scroll horizontally or maybe vertically a few screens and you could run around, kill some critters and collect resources. I haven't made a prototype. So we will see if having a prototype for a game could make a significant difference. Also I haven't come up with a name for this game, but I think the name will emerge eventually. For this episode I wanted to keep everything as simple as possible. So I haven't wrote much code but instead I've been molesting tiles on the tile molester. I drew my main character and some background tiles. Then I took all the tiles and using the NES screen tool application I drew a name table or a single screen for the game. Also I drew a placeholder title screen. The NES screen tool lets you to export your creation as assembly files. So you can import them in your main assembly code as the ROM data. Later I wrote this simple code that reads screen data from the ROM and feeds it to the PPU. Also I constructed the main character as a combination of four sprite tiles. It's not animated yet, but you can control it. Compared to the Atari 2600, it was very easy to achieve. You just specify four sprites. One sprite is four bytes of data, by the way. And write those bytes to a particular memory address. To move the sprite on the screen, you just need to change particular bytes that corresponds with the X, Y coordinate of the sprite. I haven't implemented the collision detection yet and the dude can't interact with the environment for now. To test the ROM on the real hardware I used this inexpensive flash card. My own cartridge was wired for 16 kilobytes PRG ROM plus it takes time to erase both EEPROM chips. So the flash card was more convenient. But I promise I will have my cartridge ready as well. You might notice there is a status bar on the top of the screen. It's made using a zero sprite technique. I might talk about it in depth in my future videos. Basically the zero sprite keeps the HUD in one place while the background is scrolling. And yeah, my background can scroll horizontally, but the endless scrolling doesn't make much sense now. So I commented it out. My future goals would be to add some animations to the main character and finally implement the 
collision detection. Also, to make possible for the character to enter his little hut. And of course, scroll the background when the character moves further away. Will I be able to do all that? And what struggles I will need to overcome? You will see in my next video. So subscribe the channel so you won't miss it. For now, you can find my new project on GitHub. The link is in the description. So thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.